But today we are going to talk about uh, why and how um, we can evangelize Muslims. And um, unbeknownst to him, actually Curtis gave me a little introduction yesterday. We've never met before and he doesn't know my story. And I felt like it was the Holy Spirit kind of <laughs> giving this little introduction for me. And um, as, he's, as he said, preaching the gospel, not only to Muslims, of course, but to everybody in our life, you know, starting with our family, close friends, is, um, is, is paramount to not only their spiritual life, but our spiritual life. Because the more we talk about, talk about Christ and share him with our lives, not just talking, of course, then uh, the closer we get to him. Uh, so to, uh, today I want to start with um, seven tips on evangelizing Muslims. Um, my friend there has handouts. Uh, if you haven't received one, I just wanted to give you uh, this one. And after these seven tips, we will talk about the difference between Allah and God the Father, because I think it's a really important part of understanding the differences between the two religions. Um, but let's start with this. Um, so one of the things, I think I will also mention it tomorrow, but when I first, for the first time, met a, a Christian missionary, she wasn't Catholic, she was a Protestant missionary in Turkey, um, we were talking about how Christianity is a Western invention, right? This is one of the things we are brought up to believe as Muslim children. And she's like, it's not Western. So she turns around her Bible, opens the back, and of course there's, there's a map of Turkey in there, right? Of course, it's before it was Turkey. And I'm like, this is such a lie. I bet she has a, they have a map of China in the, <laughs> in the Chinese Bibles, right? Because like we are taught to believe um, that nothing a Christian says is believable. Right? They are always try to like trick you with their missionary trickies. Um, they're trying to bribe you into becoming um, Christians, and they're, they're trying to subvert your morality. So I'm like, oh, there she is, because I knew nothing about Christianity. So if you encounter a Muslim, either online or here, or you travel to a Muslim country, uh, which is becoming more and more common, and some of you, you may have encountered Muslims already, also, um, Islam is a very missionary religion. They want to spread Islam, as you know, if you truly believe it, you would want to spread it. So, you know, um, let the best men win, I suppose. And um, they want to spread Islam. So what you will see that there is an increasing Muslim presence online and they're very good about it. And a lot of youth, especially in this relativistic culture, uh, they are drawn to Islam. Like that's one of the most common emails I get from the parents of kids who grow up in Catholic families. They go to college, meet a Muslim community, and they feel very attracted to this religion because it's very simple, right? It doesn't require you to make these like heart changes, like serious internal conversions like Christ asks. And of course, it's very world, worldly attractive. And uh, my husband was a um, corrections officer for a long time, and 25% um, of his prison uh, in, in America was Muslims. Because yes, it's, you know, it's very common. If, anybody, if you know anybody um, who works in, in prison ministry or in prisons, they would say the same. Same thing, they have a completely different schedule during Ramadan because it attracts that worldly pride and masculinity, um, not the like true Christ-like masculinity, but the false masculinity that the, you know, the, the world teaches. And it's also, they are very community oriented. So as Christians, we just need to be aware of what we are going up against. So. We will talk about a little more uh, about what kind of religion Islam is, but also we need to remember that it's, it's a very community-oriented um, people, and it's like regardless of what country. I was talking to Steve Ray earlier, and he said um, he lives right next to the biggest, um, I can't remember the town right now, uh, biggest uh, Muslim community in America, and 
De Dearborn. Dearborn, yes, thank you. And I'm like, really? And he was telling me how they come together more and more and try to change the culture. Again, we are all on board for that, but they are doing it, you know, um, small ways in more efficiently. So you will inevitably, probably, um, encounter a Muslim either online, work job, when you go to vacation, you know, they're there. It's a, it's a global world and it keeps shrinking. So, um, and because most of the Muslims believe that um, Christians are subversive and liars and, you know, and um, there isn't much you can do to change that. So it, as every missionary effort, every evangelization effort, wherever you go, should start with prayer. And this is even more important with Muslims. And um, here is uh, what St. Paul says in Romans. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. So I was thinking about, um, again, Curtis Martin said about St. Therese. Like you may not talk to Muslims ever, but if you just keep praying for them, praying for them. And this um, religion has a lot of spiritual components in it, a lot of superstition, and I believe a lot of demonic activity which requires a ton of prayer, a ton of intercession, and fasting. If you could put aside a day to fast once a month, once a year, you know, an afternoon, you know, there's so much power in it. So you always need to be prayerful and start there and assign a um, patron saint to this person because there's just, um, there's a lot of unseen, invisible struggle going on there. So, um, and secondly, be faithful. So again, one of the things um, as, I, as I was growing up, one of the things was we had all these Turkey, old Turkish movies, right? So of course the Turkish men are very strong, handsome, um, you know, uh, very, it's just very likable and they are heroic. And all the bad guys were Christians wearing big crosses on their chest. And they, you know, they lied, cheated, plundered villages, raped, awful people and all Christian uh, women were, you know, loose <laughs> and they were trying to tempt the, you know, um, virtuous uh, Muslim men. So as we grow up, we see this over and over again. And of course, what they import from the West uh, since, you know, this, um, uh, this secular culture became dominant. I mean, consider what you see in Hollywood and consider now living in a Muslim country and watching all this stuff and thinking that's what Christianity is because they can't tell the difference with, between authentic Christianity and secularism. To them, it's all kind of a big, big mesh, right? So one of the most important things before you can even consider talking about Christianity or theology or arguing, discussing or whatever, is that you have to have a solidly virtuous and faithful life. Because then they're like, oh, look how much he loves his wife, serves and cherishes her. Oh, look at the wife. She's a devoted wife and a mother and loves Christ. So, um, and again, I will share this tomorrow, but that was one of the biggest witnesses. Like, um, because that peace, joy, and love that comes from, from Christ, it, it cannot be seen in a Muslim family. And like most Muslims, Muslims grow up, well, all Muslims grow up with this like, slave master kind of relationship, constant hierarchy, and that um, love and peace our Lord offers is non-existent. So when you see it, it kind of slaps you in the face. Um, so you're like, okay, I want that. I don't know what that is, but I want that. And there is just enormous attraction to it. And of course, you need to realize that the first victim of Islam as a religion is Muslims. You were, most of us were blessed, well, I wasn't, but <laughs> blessed to be born in, uh, in the West, right? So you had the opportunity to, to learn about Christ. And not everybody had equal opportunity, of course, but they were born in a Muslim country. They don't know anything different. So as they grow up, they are stuck in this, you know, bubble where there is no joy and love as Christ offers. So when they see it, 
is just an, just an enormous witness. A good, faithful, Catholic, prayerful, devout life is an enormous witness. So um, always be faithful. So that's, um, then that should come before any conversation, if, if possible. And be joyful. Again, um, it's similar to being faithful. Um, and um, like, the king, <laughs> like the king of Assyria, it, that's mentioned in Ezra. The Lord had made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them. I was talking to someone earlier today. Um, I don't know if he is here, but he mentioned how his friend goes to these conferences and when he comes back, like there's this um, like violence and vengeance in his eyes, right? Because Islam is not a religion of joy. And a true authentic Christian joy, not like you know, happy bubbly always kind of because we can't be and life is hard. But the true joy that comes from Christ is, again, is so unheard of. Like they don't understand like how we can accept suffering, right? And then be joyful within this suffering. Or we can be joyful in our, um, like in daily mundane tasks like folding the laundry or doing the dishes or going to work, right? So um, always, you know, remember that you, the joy you have, everybody can see. Again, this is of course true when you're evangelizing, not just Muslims, but um, everybody else. And one of the things is um, this being faithful and being joyful it makes you very like spiritually attractive that they want to spend more time with you. They want to get to know you a little more. And then slowly that mistrust that they grew up with will start to shatter and they will bring, you know, bring about a friendship where they, they're ready to listen to, right? Like I am not inclined to listen to a complete strangers, stranger on the street. Like, I don't know you. Why should I take your advice? But a good faithful Catholic friend, yes, I will take their advice. I will answer your questions. And then, um, then that I will open my heart to them. So that being faithful and joyful will bring you to friendship. And um, the Eastern culture, the Muslim culture, is very different than Western. Again, they're very community-oriented, and it's very hierarchical, and there are a lot of ru rules around the house, or the way you talk to people, like, you know, growing up, if an elder, like so, somebody who is older than me came to the house, if they didn't have to be elder, elderly, five years older than me, I had to get up, leave my place, and then, um, you know, do my best to serve them, which is a great, you know, way to show respect, right? So there's a lot of rules like that. So, you know, I was taught how to properly carry a glass of water, Right, how how to be a good um, um, good ho good host when you have guests. So these are very important things. So it's not like as relaxed as the American you know American uh, culture. So um, it's like um, our Lord talks about how when you go into a house, you don't like sit yourself at the head of the table in case you make yourself a fool. You wait until. Um, you try to sit at the humblest place and you will be honored if they ask you to go to the head of the table. So there are a lot of rules that you may not know in a Muslim household, especially you are personally interacting, or even in your speech, you need to be a lot more, you know, kind of respectful and remember. And um, I like this word, uh, verse from Sirach, the foot of a fool rushes into a house, but a man of experience stands respectfully before it. So you go into people's house, you know, they take their shoes off all the time because house, their homes is a clean, sacred kind of place. So uh, always be respectful to their um, traditions. And be purpose purposeful. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. So, like, clearly Jesus knows everything. Why is he asking a question to the Pharisees? So again, uh, we will talk about the servile fear here in a bit. Uh, but it's very hard to understand for the Western mind to understand that um, they kind of, as they grow up, they grow up in the servile fear that... Um, they are not supposed to question Allah. They are not ever supposed to question Muhammad. 
Um, they can't even, you know, draw pictures of Muhammad, like let alone question it. So you kind of grow up with this fear that you may go to hell, you may be struck or whatever. As they grow up, it builds a very strong wall. So to break that wall, it's almost sometimes you need like a really traumatic experience. And it takes a long time to come to a place to question Islam. And of course, they don't trust Christians because, you know, we kind of lie and cheat and all that stuff. So what happens is like you need to be very purposeful with your questions, right? Like, you know, ask them about their own religion. Try to tell, get them to think about what they actually believe. Because what happens is Islam, once you start questioning it, is a house of cards. It just like, you know, collapses. So there isn't, you know, there isn't much substance there. But the trick is to bring people to question. And if once they start questioning your own religion, you know, they talk about Bible is changed. And then you're like, okay, when, who, why, how did this happen? So um, be purposeful with your questioning and reasoning and listen and try to make them dig deeper so they can come to that place where their question will help them break that wall of fear. And then, you know, then they can see the, see the truth. Okay. And be peaceful, right? Um, yes, did I? Yeah. Yes, so Muhammad is the man, their prophet, right? Um, so he's more like Moses. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Be peaceful. In me, you may have peace in the world you have tribulation but be of good cheer i have overcome the world so again um the gospel um the gospel sounds like foolishness when they first hear it again because we've been living in it we don't realize how crazy it sounds is that you know god became man and he died on the cross and then he resurrected like all this stuff christians believe is crazy and not to, you know, not to only atheists, but to Muslims too, because it's a very, like, worldly, carnal kind of religion, Islam is. So they cannot just imagine it. So it sounds insane. And so you, in the middle of this, you know, constant battle, you, as you preach the gospel, should find your peace and stay there. And, um, and they will be very argumentative and feisty often, most of the Muslims are very, um, they're very hospitable and caring and kind, but when it comes to Islam, they will argue. And this is nothing, nothing bad, because it's not, like, uh, it's not like here you don't talk about politics or religion. They're like, what else is there to talk about? You know, these are like utterly important things. It's my eternal destiny. Of course I want to talk about Islam. So uh, they will get feisty and argumentative. And within that, you must always remain, you know, retain your peace. And even that peace and joy you show in your argumentation, that is going to be a witness in itself. But lastly, again, this kind of goes back to being um, prayerful, is be hopeful. Because in the end, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, right? You can't change anybody's heart. You can't change anybody's mind. Um, so I will talk about this tomorrow, that like how long it took for the Lord to like kind of chase me and slap me and give me people and just show me all these things. And I still didn't get it. Right. And finally, in the end, he's like, OK, I'm going to just slap her upside head. Like I, I look back on my conversion story. I'm just completely the sidekick. It's not like, you know, it's just he's, it's, it's the Lord pursuing people. So that's at the heart of evangelization. There's so much we can do. And often we are like, you know, little kids who are trying to help their moms bake a cookie in the kitchen. We're making more of a mess than an actual nice cookie. Right. Um, and at the same time, the Lord doesn't need us, right? I mean, we have to do it for our own salvation, salvation of the others. He, let, he chooses to help, let us help in this kitchen. And he gives us like all the tools, everything we need, the Holy Spirit, all of that. But at the end, he's the one. He's the cook. He puts it in the oven and bakes the whole thing and gets it out perfectly. So we just like, we do as much as we can and that's it, you know, 
We're just going to be hopeful that he's going to carry out his own work. I mean, that's one of the things, again, Curtis was talking about. You know what? There are no Catholic... Like, it's so hard to find Catholic missionaries in Muslim countries because, you know, again, we will talk about it it's kind of because of universalism. Hey, you just be a good Muslim and you'll go to heaven. Um, then there are no Catholic missionaries, but the Lord is like, okay, fine, I'll give them visions and dreams. There are just scores of Muslims becoming Christian. Um, I met this um, young lady. She was, um, she, she's from Egypt, and she grew up uh, Muslim. And during Ramadan, she's praying, every, you know, she's fasting every day and praying. It's a very kind of a holy time for them. And she started to, as she read the Quran, she started to kind of question. And she's like, all these suspicions and questions are getting in her head. So she prayed that Allah, I, I don't want to have these um, uh, suspicions anymore. Please send me a dream of Muhammad so I don't have to have these um, the suspicions anymore. Like they want to be at peace with their dream. So she goes to sleep and she has a dream of our Lord with our lady standing be behind him. So, like, she was not ex exposed to Christianity more than, you know, your average Muslim. Egypt is, you know, there's a little more exposure because of Coptic Christians. So she knew that she had to find a Catholic church. And she, she went, and the Protestants were ready to baptize them. They're like, do, do you believe in marriage? She's like, no, 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 no. They're like, we don't do that. We don't do the marriage thing. It's a Catholic thing. But the Catholics w were not, they were not willing to, uh, baptize her, initiate her in any manner because they didn't want to get in trouble with the, um, with the, uh, but you know, that's one of the things. Our Lord instituted the, the sacraments. So we can, unlike Protestants, you know, we can't become Catholics without a priest. <laughs> you know, we need the sacraments to continue the, the, this fight. So we need, obviously, Holy Spirit is doing his job, but we need to do our part, you know, uh, which again, we will talk about it. So, um, he will send, you know, visions, um, dreams, and all these, like, amazing stuff. Uh, there was a sheikh um, in Iraq, and he got hurt in the leg, and it festered, and it's like he's, he's about to die. So um, in his, like, delirium, he saw somebody touching his leg, and he saw that um, he, he kind of woke up, and he said, who are you? He's, and he said... I'm Jesus, son of Mary, healing you. And this guy wakes up. Um, his leg is completely healed. The guy became Catholic, ex escaped, um, escaped Iraq and living in hiding because, you know, it's not taken very <laughs> kindly when you convert. So, like, the Lord is always working in people. So that's why being prayerful, being hopeful is just so important because he is going to do his good work. So now... Um, Let's go and talk about, <laughs> let's talk about Islam a little bit. So, um, do Muslims and Christians believe in the same God? Uh, again, it's um, in, the, in the Lumen Gentium, um, in, of Vat, it's one of the documents of the Vatican II. Uh, it says, together with us, Muslims adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day. So this was very, and this was a very important um, sentence, along with another one, Nostra Aetate, again in, in Vatican II. So the thing is, yes, they do worship the same God because they profess one God, right? Um, he's the creator of all things visible and invisible, omniscient, impo imp uh, omnipotent, and uh, not, oh my goodness, I did not. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, sorry, Lord. I'm going to get struck here in the sanctuary, calling God impotent, omnipotent, sorry, um, and omnipresent, right? So these are all the attributes we believe. So, um, and um, yeah, I know, can you skip? <laughs> it's like, I, I think maybe we should. I'm so sorry. Um, this is just, I can't unseat anymore. Um, so, <laughs> I know, right? It's not my fault. It's not Turkish or English. This is as much as I can do. So we all believe in these attributes, right? So they, they believe 
um, all of these. And you need to remember, most Muslims, they don't read the Quran, they don't read the Hadith. It's a, it's a religion that's passed down to you from your parents, from the, you know, Imam. Um, so like, you're not, even, even when they read the Quran, you're supposed to read it in Arabic. And if Arabic isn't your, you know, mother tongue, then you're kind of just reciting um, this stuff that you have no idea what it is about. So, because the Lord had put this desire, when you take notes, please fix, <laughs> fix my awful, um, um, awful typo there. Um, but because the Lord put his, in, you know, it says in the Romans that he put his law in our hearts, right? We are all born, even if, you know, we are in this remote um, African tribe or clueless, you know, Muslim country, we are all born with a desire to worship him. So like um, one of the things uh, Bishop Sheen said that, so it's like if the t complete truth is a circle, every religion has a little bit of it. Right, so if it's 360 degrees, you know, I don't know, Hinduism had three degrees, right? <laughs> you know, so it, it, they all, because we are all born with that desire, because we have the same creator. So I think most Muslims, in their ignorance, direct their worship to our Lord. So, you know, in that sense, it's yes, right? We believe in the same God. But the problem becomes when it's like, it's a little bit no, too. Like, it's a very qualified yes. So you need to be very careful. Um, it's a no because it's like this. So you go to, um, two people are talking about a man named John. And one person is like, oh, I know John. He's six foot um, tall. Uh, he's a brunette. He has a big beard. And uh, he's a drunkard and beats his wife. And this other guy says, oh, I know a John too. He's six foot tall, brunette with a tall beard, but he's the kindest person I've ever met. And he's a wonderful uh, husband and a wife. I mean, no, husband, I'm sorry. I should go listen to the um, against woke speech <laughs> right after this. And he's a wonderful husband. So it's like, which one it is? Is it like, okay, you know, they're talking about the same person but the person, they have like opposite witnesses about the character, even though they get the physical stuff, right? So I think that is what the problem is with, between Islam and Christianity, God of Christianity. Um, and um, we will talk about the differences, but this section in the Vatican do too, together with us, they adore the one merciful God, it kind of pushed a lot of Catholics to believe that, hey, we all believe this in the same God, like, why should we go evangelize? Why should we even, like, bother them with this? You know, it's a lot of work to go all the way there and talk to them and then possibly get killed. And, you know, these are kind of <laughs> hard, hard choices. So, I mean, then we really dropped the ball. St. Francis is not happy about it. Um, but the thing is, it's not just, it's the eternal life, right? It's not a, just the person's eternal faith. Like, I don't think I would be here. I was a suicidal atheist when I met these Protestant missionaries. I don't think I would be literally here if I didn't, you know, if Christ didn't completely change my life. And all you need to do is read a few conversion stories to see how much the Lord completely transformed people's lives for the better on this earth, right? So it's not just, you know, the afterlife or eternal, which is obviously very important, but also like he makes our lives for the better on this side. And look at the societies. I mean, it's, um, it's funny because like since I moved here, I look at these feminists, I'm like, you're, you're not going to say anything about the stuff that's happening in the Muslim countries to women? No, it's very anti-feminist. Um, but what they don't understand is women have, women have this many rights because of Christianity. It's not because we have progressed or we have lived long enough that we have become better. Like, no, look at everybody, everywhere else. No, nowhere except the post-Christian countries, women have this much, this much right this many rights, because 
we believe that we are all created equal before the Lord. And we have equal, men and women have equal dignity. We have completely different but equally important roles in the family and in the society. You look at these awful medieval times and look at all these, you know, um, abbess, abbesses along with the abbots and everybody else um, changing the course of history. You, you look at Catherine of Siena giving, you know, a piece of her mind to the popes, right? Like this just, this happened before of, because of Christianity. You talk about slavery. You think slavery is extinct because we became more civilized? Like we don't live in a Star Trek world. Like as, we, as technology advances, we are all going to be post-religion and sterile and perfect. No, slavery doesn't exist anymore. It's because of Christ, because we are all equal before the Lord. I mean, who were the most famous abolitionists? They were Christians, that they believed that there was human dignity and, you know, God's own image and likeness in every person. Like, basically everywhere else, slave labor, either legally or illegally, continues. In all Muslim countries, I mean, look at China, you know, supposedly in a communist country, everybody is equal, but apparently some are more equal than others. And um, there is, you know, um, the fact of slavery in, in these communist countries. So that's what is not seen, is that Christ, Christianity transforms entire societies. It's not just a person's life. So what you're saying when you don't want to evangelize, well, you're not good enough. The, the Muslim woman who gets raped and killed because of that, you're not good enough to live, a, you know, hear the gospel. You just live a Muslim life and you, you will be okay. No, they won't be okay. Women suffer terribly in Muslim countries and men too, you know, in different ways. So preaching the gospel not changes, but it changes the society and the world eventually. That's why it's too selfish to keep it to, to yourself. So hence the universalism. It's my piece about it. I, I am not very opinionated about it, can you tell? Um, so the biggest difference, so Islam, um, you know what, I think maybe I should talk about this after that, but um, one of the biggest um, differences that Islam denies the Trinity. So, so, um, so Muhammad claims that the, their book, if you're not familiar, their book, the Quran, came from Allah, like not the way inspired by the Holy Spirit, but literally dictated, like he would go into these um, seizures. So I think he was like half epileptic, epileptic, <laughs> thank you, epileptic, half um, demon, demon influenced, right? So he would go into these like seizures, lose himself, and he would wake up, oh, this is what Allah told me, and then like it's written down. So it's like literal dictation from Allah, so it's not inspired, right? So, um, but he lived in a very um, polytheistic society. So they had, you know, you know the box that they, you know, they, uh, Kaaba. So it was filled with idols. So he just went in there and cleaned it up. So he was very afraid of polytheism. Uh, but he was illiterate. And he heard a lot of stories from Jews and Christians. So if you read the Quran, which is not like, very readable like the Bible. It's just bits and pieces. It feels like a broken bits and pieces homilies, and it's very hard to read. But if you like some penance and like to read it, you will realize that there are bits and pieces of stories from um, uh, all, especially the Old Testament, put together to make his point. Does it make sense? So he's trying to establish a continuity here. And he says that it was um, Archangel Gabriel that uh, dictated the Quran to him. So this is what Muslim Islam teaches. So Allah, you know, the, so I'm referring the Muslim God as Allah just for clarity, but Christians in the Middle East, they call God Allah, but I'm just trying to help differentiate. So Allah sent Moses and Zebur, like the part of the Old Testament, and those evil Jews corrupted it. And, um, and then Allah sent Jesus and the uh, angel, which is the New Testament, and the evil Christians corrupted it. And then Allah said, Muhammad, and he's the seal of the prophets. And, um, and Quran was like kept pristine in the most amazing um, way. And be because Arabic is the dictated language, that's the only way to get brownie points. So it's like, um, 
so the book itself is, is, is very sacred. So, so he was very afraid of polytheism and he didn't understand the Trinity. And um, there is like good, um, good reasons to believe that he was, he was surrounded by Nestorians who were kicked out of Asia Minor and they ended up in um, Saudi Arabia. So like there was a serious confusion about the Trinity in him. So what, um, like there is, this is, this is a verse from the Quran. Oh, Jesus, son of Mary, did you say unto men, take me and my mother as gods apart from God? So it's like, so it's God, the father, Jesus, and Mary. So like there was serious confusion and, um, and, and Jesus in return, he says, to thee be glory. It is not mine to say what I have no right to. If I indeed said it, thou knowest it, knowing what, it, what is within my soul. So the God knows what's in Jesus' soul. He's mere human, right? And I know not what is within thy soul. Because like Jesus is mere human, how can he possibly know what's in God? In God? So what, when they imagine Trinity, it's not like the way um, the Catholic Church teaches, but it's more like three actual deities, like the idols. Um, so, and so it's a big no-no to Trinity. And of course, incarnation is completely unthinkable, right? Because Allah is infinitely good, not good, infinitely holy. And like, um, Islam is a little um, Gnostic in that sense that human beings are like inherently kind of on the evil bad side, right? It, they're kind of dirty and unclean. Uh, the same is true with like sex. It's like they have to purify themselves right after, uh, after it. So like there is this like uncleanliness and disgustingness about human beings. And it's like it, to, to imagine, to think that God will become one of us, it's just like, it just brings them from these heights. Like it's completely unthinkable, blasphemous. They start, you know, kind of ripping their, their clothes. So obviously they're against Trinity, the incarnation. And of course, you know, um, crucifixion and resurrection, um, which is odd because I'm like, you know, a lot of prophets died. Like, why are you so against the crucifixion? Um, so again, Muhammad is kind of a messed up uh, guy, right? And he, um, he was persecuted in his hometown because they're thinking, hey, aren't you the Muhammad that who was, you know, who grew up next to us? Like, why are you acting like you're the leader of a, this big, big religion? So he was persecuted there. And so he really identified with Jesus. But he was very worldly. Like if you read the Hadith and uh, Muhammad's life, you'll realize that, you know, he loved women, he loved the money, the power and all that stuff. So he's looking at Jesus. I'm very much like him, but his end wasn't good. So he couldn't imagine that Allah would let his prophet die in an awful manner, right? So because he, he wanted to be always victory, victorious. And again, because it's a very worldly religion, they, he, he said, if you're a good Muslim, Allah is on your side and you will never lose anything. So um, that's why he kind of changed the crucifixion and resurrection. But obviously they are, um, they are very much against it. Okay, so those are the, um, do we worship the same God? So it's a very, very qualified yes. So when you say yes, you need to be very careful because the way they see God is just completely different than ours. So the major difference is I will talk about what St. Thomas calls servile fear and filial fear. We kind of touched upon this a little bit, uh, but again, I think it's very important if you want to evangelize Muslims to understand this con concept. So servile fear is the slave's fear of a master who would punish him. So um, I took this class about history of the American South and um, there was just a bunch of, you know, obviously Americans taking this <laughs> class with me. And one of the things that we read that um, the, the Northerners didn't understand why the slaves didn't rise up against their masters. And I'm thinking, I don't think you understand slavery, my man. Like, I don't think you understand how growing up in bondage and with fear, and you, it, like, it paralyzes you on the inside. I opened my, I opened my book from Islam the Christ with um, 
with this anecdote, I was a little girl, so six, seven years old, and, uh, you know, we kind of were taught our prayers and memorized everything. And one of the things we taught were never to ever try to imagine Allah in, like, like picture what he may look like, right, you know? Um, and because, like, you would, you know, you would go burn in hell and you will be struck and all that stuff. So one night I'm laying in bed and I'm thinking, like, what Allah would look like, and I'm thinking this, like, cloudy kind of shape with rainbow eyes and then suddenly I was struck with fear. I'm like six, seven years old, at least seven because I was going to school. And I'm struck with this fear of punishment. Like I, I was so afraid, I couldn't sleep that night. I wake up to go to school and we lived by this creek and there were these huge boulders there. I'm like, oh, those are the children who try to imagine Allah and I'm gonna become one of them. So like for days I left, with, I felt with this fear every time I passed the creek, thinking that I'm going to become one of the boulders, because like you are, you are kind of this intense fear from an early age, like a slave. So that's the servile fear. And it's like St. Thomas says, it's not necessarily bad. Um, like I have a toddler, which um, she's this big, and I tell her, no, don't touch the oven. She's looking at me as like, She's really much bigger than me, and she can, you know, she can take me, so I'm going to listen to her. If she doesn't, I'll slap her hand, because guess what? I don't want her to burn on the stove, right? So that is servile fear, because she doesn't understand, oh, my mother loves me, and she doesn't want me to get burned. All she understands is, like, this really big lady told me now, and it really, it sting a little bit when I hit that. So, like, that's the servile fear. So it's the beginning, right? Like when we say the act of contrition, we say um, we fear hell, but more, you know, we are afraid of disappointing you. So fear of hell is imperfect contrition, right? That's servile because, because we don't want to be punished by this all-powerful just being. But if we filial fear, I don't know if the, the, is it the next one, filial fear? is what it needs to turn into. It is the fear of a good child who fear dishonoring a loving parent, which is completely different, right, when you think about in nature. So my toddler is going to, you know, hopefully grow up to say, oh, my mother told me to not to touch the stovetop because she knows that I'm going to be burnt. Or um, I was talking to my 11-year-old, um, and he did... <coughs> He did something he wasn't supposed to. And um, I said, I'm going to tell daddy. He's like, no, 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 no. And um, as, you know, as kids say, and I'm like, you know, your daddy is so much more lenient and forgiving than me because like I'm the harder parent. My husband is like this big marine teddy bear kind of guy, but he's scared looking. And when he does the daddy voice, it's like sometimes I'm like, okay, what did I do? You know, so but they are more afraid of him because they are so afraid of dishonoring this father because they don't want his disapproval, you know? I wish I had that power, but uh, yeah. I was, you know, when I try to scare them with my voice, it comes out as a shriek and they're like, ah, stop talking. So um, that's, the, that's the biggest thing, right? That's, that's the perfect contrition. When we mortally sin, we are not like, oh man, I'm going to burn in hell. You're like, no, I'm sorry, Lord. You know, I'm so sorry. I tried to do better, but it didn't happen. That is the contrition we want. That's the filial fear because we just, we just don't want to disappoint. We don't want to disappoint our heavenly father. And that's a big difference in understanding of who God is. Like on the one side, we're talking about this guy, John, who's six foot tall, brunette and abusive right? Like God is very capricious and he's a God of vengeance and he's a God of, um, like they say he's a God of vengeance and mercy. And I'm like, I don't think they go very well together, you know, and he puts good and evil. And if he like, if, he, and he tempts you to do something, to do um, bad stuff. So um, it's like the Zoroasterians. I don't know if you're familiar, familiar with that religion. They have a good God, everything good comes from, and they, they have an evil God, that everything evil comes from. So Allah is like combined them, like combined them both. You don't know, and you can't kind of attribute, you can't even say he's all good because then you're limiting God. 
for instance, sin is a sin in Islam because Allah says so, right? It's completely different understanding of sin. In, in Christianity, we call something sin because it's bad for us, right? It's an absence of goodness. It takes away our creation. And God cannot look upon sin because he's unable, so you're limiting him, but he's, no, because he's all pure. He's pure and good, and he can't look upon sin. So it's like on the one hand, you have this John, who's an abusive husband and a dad, and on the, on the one hand, you have this John, they seem to look the same, but a wonderful, loving and caring um, father and husband. So that is an important difference between servile fear and um, filial fear. And it's so hard to bring, take Muslims out of this mindset of servile fear and make them accept, um, accept God as, as their father, because that's like unthinkable. And within that, uh, they are so um, convinced and, you know, um, that only Muslims will go to heaven because, you know, everybody else is, is, um, is unbelievers. So, in, so they are surrounded with this immense servile fear and they also believe that for you to go to heaven, you need to be Muslim. So they can, but in, to be a Muslim, all you need to do is to say the Shahada, which is, you know, Allah is one God, Muhammad is his prophet and ambassador and all that stuff. And then you're Muslim. It doesn't require you to do anything else, basically. Whereas in Christianity, the Lord demands that you amend your life. You know, it's like this constant struggle towards the good. Um, it sounds really hard, and it is hard, as we know that we fall and pick up again. But this is what a loving father does, right? He wants you to get better. He wants to be closer to him, and he wants to have a better life. Um, like one of the, um, if they ask a bunch of, um, I think in Pakistan, Pakistani school children, no, India, India, I'm sorry, Indian school children, um, whether Mother Teresa, would go to heaven because, you know, even in India, she was really well known because she's helped so many people. And the kids say, um, uh, no, since she was not a Muslim. And the teacher says, but she saved thousands of lives, right? Like, why can't she go? Well, she wants to be rewarded for that in this world, but one can't enter heaven until he, she says the Shahada. So, Evil Muslims, you can be an awful evil Muslim who said the Shahada, and you may burn in hell for, I don't know, a couple thousand years, then you will eventually go to heaven. But if you're not a Muslim, then there's no way you can go to heaven. And they will do whatever it takes for your eternal, you know, destiny to take you there. And if that needs to, that means that they're going to make you say the Shahada at the end of a sword, so be it. That's why they don't care, right? They're doing you a favor in, in their minds. But again, it's like this combination of extreme conviction and the servile fear, right? And that's, that's the biggest, biggest difference. And of course, um, now, um, Scott Hahn always tells this anecdote that he was, he was having an argue, um, discussion with, a, a, with an imam, and he referred to, um, to God as God the Father, and the guy just, you know, he said, no, and um, if you're going to refer to, uh, you know, God as God the Father, we can't talk. They can't even fathom God as Father. Like, it's unthinkable to them because, like, you're bringing him to your, to your level, right? Like, it's, whereas in, in uh, Christianity, I think one of the best descriptions of who, uh, who God is is the story of the prodigal son. So... We have this God, right? He's a great father, uh, but he's, you know, he's just. Like this kid comes, he's like, I want my inheritance. I want to go away. He's just, and he gave us freedom to choose. So it's like, here's your inheritance. And we leave. And what does he do? He waits. He pr probably the prodigal son. I mean, God doesn't need to pray, but he, um, uh, father, the, the father of the prodigal son prayed for his son, for his like, you know, goodness and so that he can return, return home. And in his love, he waits and he waits and he loves his son so much, even after he kind of spent all this money 
squanders this inheritance and comes back, you know, stinky and smelly, he still loves him so much that he opens his heart. It's like he's a wonderful father who's full of love. And this is unthinkable for Muslims. To bring them to this place is so hard. To, you know, just praying God, the, you know, our father. It's like, no, you're making God so small. You're, ma you're, you're making him dirty and unclean and so, like, um, impotent <laughs> by, making, by making him, like, human. It's like this ultimate... For them, it's like, it's, a, it's an immense insult. So they can just, they cannot think about it. And another thing is, um, St. Thomas says this, that it's, it's a very carnal religion, right? It's where, you know, Muhammad was really obsessed with women. So when you say God the Father, they think, oh, it's like Zeus, right? Came down to earth and, you know, have uh, intercourse with women. So they cannot, like... Again, their understanding of imagination of God is so limited that no, he can make things happen without, you know, like he is God, like you're limiting him to be, you know, um, to have having to do, do this. So like when they think God, the father, they're like, no, 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 he didn't have sex with anybody. I'm like, of course he didn't. Are you crazy? Like, but they have a very hard time on understanding that. Um, so they're thinking, oh, God must have taken a wife if, you know, if he begot, if you begot a son. And um, another thing that um, makes this God so like unfather-like and unapproachable is that he, like, he doesn't love anybody. Like this idea, even like if you try to talk to Muslims about love, it's you will realize that they're mostly talking about liking something like oh i like eating pineapples and tacos or something right so it's very like kind of weak and sensual and pleasurable not like this love that we feel deep within our souls so uh like in turkish the the word for i love you and i love bananas is the same exact same word right like i mean you know like you will say i like and enjoy bananas um i mean you will say love but you wouldn't mean in English, too, that I'll, I love bananas like I like my I love my wife, right? So it's like a very weak kind of uh, love meaning. So um, of course, saying that God is love is again limits him. It's you know all that stuff not good. But when you um, when you read the Quran, you realize that He doesn't Allah doesn't love anybody unconditionally. Um, it's just he loves some people and he doesn't love others. So he kind of picks and chooses. It depends on your performance, right? So like his love or favor, I would say, his favor is dependent upon our performance, how, how well they are doing. For instance, he loves the virtues, the patient, those who keep clean, the God, um, the one who fears God, or those who trust him, the just, and those who fight in his way. But he hates the unbelievers, and he makes their heart, um, he turns their heart from him, so he, they, they never can choose to follow him. So does it make sense? So is his love or favor is so conditional, whereas like we are, we are like prodigal sons. We can never, ever earn God's love because we are so limited and little. But God the Father is like that Father. He gives his love unconditionally. You know, he love, lives us in the, like, in the pit and muck of our sin. You know, he just sees through all that dirtiness and yuckiness, and then he loves us despite everything because we are his sons. He loves the, you know, he loves the, the Muslims who, like, reject them so awfully. I mean, he's, of course, grieved about their sin, right? Like, there is, we say this, you know, hate the sin, love the sinner. And, of course, he's grieved so much about their sin. And, you know, if you are, you're a parent, you know how hard it is to see your kid fail, even like stab your toe when they're little, let alone, you know, fail in such a, in such a big, big way. So there is just this huge contrast between this, um, uh, this God who is really kind of temperamental and cap capricious, and then God the Father who just loves us so unconditionally. So now... Um, why does it matter that we know about this, right? 
Um, she fell asleep. I know it. Wake up, Meg. <laughs> I'm almost done. Hang in there. Um, so why does it matter, right? So as I said, universalism did a number, and uh, missionary efforts in Muslim countries is almost non-existent. But at the same time, you go online, and Muslims are hard at it, and they're winning souls either, um, like, you know, my own country, Turkey, become a lot more radicalized since, uh, since I left. Actually, my Christian friends told me not to ever come because I could be arrested. So, like, they are very hard at work, and they're becoming more, because what, the way the world is going, secularism is not attracted to anybody, attractive to anybody. And the, many souls are lost. So most Muslim countries, they're choosing to become radicalized because Islam offers a sense of purpose and a community. And, um, and then remember how God hates the unbelievers. So seven, uh, so Open Doors is, oh, I didn't mention it. Open Doors is a Protestant, um, pr Protestant uh, um, group that um, they record and track persecution around the globe, persecution of um, Christians. And seven out of top 10 countries, they're Muslim. Christians are, you know, murdered. Um, you know, of course, they're ostracized by the society. Um, they're, like, imprisoned. You know, they're just in house prison. They're imprisoned. I got an email from, a, um, from uh, somebody in Saudi Arabia. He's so interested. He's, like, he's convinced that Christianity is the truth, so he read everything. So he, go, he tries to go to a Catholic church, and um, they say, no, 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 you're, you're going to get us in trouble. You can't come in. So he goes back home. The following day, the, the police um, come to his workplace and tell him, we saw you trying to go into a Catholic church. You will be in trouble. So he's, like, terrified. So he knows the truth, but he's extremely terrified. Even, you know, he's like, what do I do? I'm like, I don't know, right? Like, I mean, how do you become Catholic without priests? And how can I tell him? I'm like, oh, regardless, you go find a Catholic, you know, priest and get baptized. Like, how can I even like offer that to him? This is the situ this is the situation in most countries. Like in um, in Turkey, Turkey is by far the most liberal um, uh, Muslim country. And as I said, it's just become worse since I left. But still, it's by far. But um, and I I. I experienced soft persecution in the sense that, you know, I lost friends and I knew that I could never get a government job because as soon as you become a Christian, you're like a traitor to your country. So it's nothing life threatening. But while I was living there, um, so um, there were three Protestants who were running a bookstore in the southeastern part of Turkey. And these two guys came in the morning when they opened the bookstore and slit their throats because they were trying to evangelize. Um, you know, spread the faith. Two of them were Turks and one was a German citizen. So stuff even like this happens even places like in Turkey. And a, um, a Catholic priest was murdered. Um, this youth came and shot him in the, in the back of his head. Again, this is in Turkey, one of the, you know, the most, you know, free Muslim countries because this youth was... Um, he came and shot him while he was praying because he was a Catholic priest, right? So the, it's, a, it's very hard soil. Muslim lands are like their spiritual element. Again, praying and fast, fasting is so important. And hearts are so hardened because of a God like this, right? This is, you know, you, you, know, if you, know, if you know people who have abusive parents and how like that trickles down, right? It's not... Um, you know, they say traumatize people traumatize. So it's like that. If you have a Allah as your father, that's all you hear your whole life, this master-slave relationship, all you want to become a master. You want to try to become a master of your wife, your kids. Does it make sense? So this whole society is, you know, it's almost inclined towards violence. Like if you ask people, like, is it okay to um, kill unbelievers? Um, most people, I'm telling you, most Muslims wouldn't even consider killing anybody, but they would be hard found to condemn people who kill the unbelievers. Does it make sense? So it's like 
as long as somebody else breaks the eggs. Like, you know, they wouldn't do it themselves. So this is that kind of a religion. And it's like, it's, it's a very, very hard soil. And again, Muslim countries like the transform, transformative power of Christ. And you know, how did ISIS come to be? Because I thought we were, you know, all advanced and we were moving post this, you know, all this religion stuff. But here, you know, ISIS came to be and it didn't stay there, right? They don't, it doesn't stay in their own land. It, it affects the whole world. So we have this responsibility to preach the gospel and help change lives eternally and, this, and the societies that they live in. And um, so, again, we talked about it's extremely difficult um, to evangelize in Muslim countries. Uh, like people come, you know, the, the missionaries who um, evangelized me, they didn't see any fruit for years and years. It's such a life-changing um, decision um, that people are, it's very hard. So uh, it's very hard work and you don't, see the fr you don't see the fruit. So it's not like, you know, going to, in a way, South America and then kind of um, try to bring back people to the faith. And you, you know, you may not see a lot of growth, but you will see it in a few years. But in Turkey, it's like this, almost like this thankless job. And um, we talked about the uh, persecution, but, you know, like Curtis said, yet there is thirst for truth. Right? The Lord is calling people, whether we are there or not. He's calling people and calling people. So, uh, and, you know, people are reaching out. So there is that thirst for truth. And if we want to kind of give that to people, we need to understand Islam. It doesn't mean you have to be an expert on it, but just know enough to ask these questions and to bring people to the, um, to the edge of questioning. So what do we do? Um, going forward, like how, what can we do? Okay, we, we learned about this. Even if you do nothing, we can take example from St. Therese's life. Just please pray and fast. And there are, um, there are again, this Open Doors is a great Protestant organization that um, uh, they, ha they assign a fasting and prayer day through the year um, for each Muslim country. So it's great. Or if you could just, you know, make a commitment, say one rosary a month, for the conversion of Muslims. And Our Lady will hear that. And um, I believe that she's going to pull an Our Lady of Guadalupe in one of the, in the Muslim countries. And she's like, you guys don't wanna come? Here, let me take care of that. You know, I'm hoping she's going to do that. And encourage, um, I gave a talk um, at a university near a seminary and there were a bunch of seminarians who were very, very interested about uh, going to Muslim countries. So encourage the missionary effort and, you know, pray that the Lord will bring a uh, priest and a laity to these countries so they can change hearts and um, touch, uh, uh, hearts and lives. So and I said stay in touch and I forgot to bring cards and um, things, but uh, my email address is daryalittle um, at gmail.com. So it's easy to remember. Um, and, oh, I skipped one, which is more import most important one. So there's a lot, there isn't a lot of online efforts. Oh, I th am I out of time? Am I chit-chatting too much? Okay, five minutes. Okay, wow, really? Sorry, I'm, I wanted to have a question and answer. So support online and in-person efforts. If you know missionaries, you go to Muslim countries. Or, um, like, I'm about to, can you pull up that website, Meg? Um, like I'm about to launch this website and there are a few others. There are very, very few websites who are directed against evangelizing Muslims and she's gonna put it up. It's becatholic.com. Anyway, it's not completely ready yet, um, but it's trying to explain the Catholic faith uh, to Muslims, people who grew up Muslims in that servile fear. I'll explain the Trinity in a way that it's not like you know, God, old man, and Jesus, young man, and Holy Spirit, dove, right? That just doesn't quite uh, resonate with them. So I, that's one of the websites, if you can remember. I will put it up on my website, which is daryalittle.com, um, so you, if you can spread the word.